I am Ed Veal, and I am um, branch manager at the Royal Home Hall um, McKinney Public Library right down the street here. We're hosting, so thank you all for coming. And uh, I have a, a, uh, a partner in crime who is not with me, but she's here virtually. Um, Jay-Z, would you like to say hello? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Zaro, and I am the Director of Library of Sales and Outreach at Bywater Solutions. I'm super sad that I can't be there in person, but glad that I can still join remotely. Um, Jay-Z and I worked together for, uh, okay, Jesse and I worked together for a couple, a num couple of years, I guess, um, when I was with Bywater, and we did a lot of the training, and we traveled a lot. So... Where is our introductory picture? Come on, there it is. There we are. Um, what we're gonna be talking about is, I don't wanna call them misconceptions, but the differences between working with a proprietary vendor and working within the open source community. Okay, we're gonna talk about some of those, you know, the differences, how they, pros and cons, all of those kinds of things. I hear a lot of people without knowing it, equating Bywater and Koha, and that's not the same. Koha is an open source software, Bywater is a support vendor. We're gonna talk about that in some detail as we go. So let's go ahead and get started here. There are lots of open source software packages out there, a lot of which you probably use without even knowing it, you know, things like Firefox, um, what are some of the other ones on here? VLC. Uh, we yeah. have recently, yeah, we have recently moved to OpenOffice or um, LibreOffice on all of our public computers, away from the Microsoft suite. Um, I'd like to say it saved us some money, but it didn't because it's a city contract. But it's just where we want to go. We are interested in open source. What that means. What you know, the community. So we've made that decision. A number of other um, sources here. Jesse, do you have any? Yeah, you know, GIMP is another option for those of you who want to use um, photo editing. That's a great one for photo editing. Um, GitLab. So if you ever go and use the Koha community manual, GitLab is what we use to edit that document and, and have that go live. And I'm sure people have used WordPress at one point in their life, whether it was a personal blog or a blog for a Girl Scout troop or a community church. Um, there are all different open source tools that we use in our everyday life. All right, we're gonna move into the myths and the reality. There are a lot of myths out there about open source and then there's what reality is. So let's look at a couple of, let's look at security to start with. There's this idea that open source is less secure. If you talk to your IT department, they tend to be Microsoft centric. And so they're gonna naturally say, you know, this is not the party line. We can't do open source. It's not secure. We can't. They, you know, we don't have all of these patches. We can't do our job because it's this unsecure thing. That is not truly the case. The reality is open source uh, can be much more secure. There are so many more eyes looking at the open source world. When bugs appear, when security holes are discovered, the volume of coders and people out there that find them, patch them and get those patches out at a much more rapid pace than the proprietary world. That is really the reality. It's not insecure. Jesse? Yeah, that is that is probably the number one thing, the number one question that we get when we go out and we talk to libraries. You know, they've been on proprietary systems like Circe or III for 20 plus years. And they get really, really nervous about moving to open source because they've heard all of these myths throughout the years. And this is just one of them. And of course, our next one where I think we'll talk about access or IT staff. Um, IT staff, you know, that's, that's probably the next one we hear. It's, you know, I need a full robust staff to deal with open source. And by attending this conference today, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people talk about it. 
there are multiple support vendors throughout the US and worldwide that support different open source projects. I heard Cecilia mention this morning, Omeka, in, in her presentation, you know, there's vendors out there that support that. Um, Subjects Plus, another popular open source um, platform, very similar uh, to LibGuides, you know, there are vendors throughout the, the world that support them and they're there to be your IT staff. So you can maintain your software um, and, and essentially free up time for staff. All right, support. As Jesse was just saying, there are a lot of different support companies out there. There is a great deal of support. Um, there's also community. And that's what I think is missing in, in a lot of the proprietary world. The community that builds around open source software is, is amazing. Um, and it doesn't matter the software. Koha is a great example of it, but there's great communities that build around all sorts of different open source packages. Um, through the Koha community, I have uh, met and, and gotten to know people that work with Koha worldwide. You get this, this great sense of community. Um, you have that community control. That is what runs the, the, the software. Jesse? You know, I, I will just echo what Ed says about community. If anyone attended the last session with um, Sam, where he was talking about Aspen, that's how I met Mark um, at a Koha US um, session back in 2019 in Pueblo. Mark was talking about um, an open source discovery platform. And so you meet so many more people, you find out about products that you haven't known. And there's this huge support network, whether you have a small question or a large question, you have a whole community of users to communicate with. And, and beyond just communicating with them, you can get answers. There are lots of different places to find answers. Uh, we, I think everybody in here is supported by a vendor. There are lots of individuals. There's somebody who's going to be doing a presentation tomorrow that is self-supported. They do everything themselves. They're very active in the community. He frequently reaches out for help to the community and, and he provides great deals of help to other members of the community. Um, I'll give uh, Fred a, a plug here. He's doing the presentation on um, taking Koha where it was never intended to go. He's done wonderful presentations in the past. Um, things like if you have $100, you can have an ILS. He spun Koha up on a Raspberry Pi and has it working beautifully. Um, there are all sorts of fun things that, as you get to know these people. That's the community. Now we're at Access. Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> This is, an, this is another big one we hear all the time. Um, anyone can change the code. You know, the reality here is there is a lot of back movement that happens behind the code. So, you know, the process from start to finish with any open source product is you have some type of platform that tracks all of these changes, whether it's an enhancement or a bug fix, you have a platform. For Koha, we use Bugzilla. Um, and that's where any type of suggestion or code is placed that they want to see. And once that piece of code is there, it goes through a process of testing. Um, it goes through a process of quality assurance. And then it makes it goes through a process of making sure that the manager for that particular release approves it, meaning it doesn't break anything else in the system. Um, while it goes through. So there is a lot of moving pieces uh, before anyone can change the code when they're getting into the system. Um, I wanna take this in a slightly different direction as well. Um, the myth anyone can change the code is also a reality. If you download the software, you run it on your machine, you can do anything you want with it. It's open source, it's yours, you can do it. You, you download it, you break it, you fix it. That's where the idea of needing huge IT staff come from, because you can do that. Um, that uh, during Cecilia's presentation this morning, she mentioned a number of other open source ILS type things. There are a number of them that were up on that slide that's foundation was within Koha. Um, people took Koha and decided, you know, it's not really 
working well in our instance. So they forked it and they've built a community around a, a totally new product using th this development in the community, you know, their own community. They're building their own communities to make that do what they need it to do. Um, I've forgotten which one was up there that jumped, but there's one that's uh, originally Koha that's really designed for school libraries, uh, Opals. Opals. Yeah, it was, was Koha at the back end. And over the years, it's very different now, but you can get in and change the code. Okay. Passiveness and engagement. That is a huge difference between the open source community and a vendor environment. If, if I'm using a proprietary vendor, I'm sitting here in my library waiting for the next thing to happen waiting for them to tell me what's coming down the pike. I have no responsibility. I have no control. I have no, I'm just getting what they're feeding me. Um, passively sitting here, cutting them checks every year. <laughs> the open source community thrives on engagement. Every developments that come into Koha, change the slides here. Um, all of the developments that come in are community driven. Everything is about the engagement with the community. So if, if you're using an open source product, yet you're using a support vendor and you've decided to take that passive path, that's, that's fine, but realize you're acting as if it's a proprietary vendor. You're missing out on the huge world of open source really by doing that. Um, the Bywater folks over here don't mind when we push them to come up with things. The support vendors don't mind when you push them to, to try to come up with some new developments, to try to do things, to try to come up with that stuff. Jesse, would you like to say anything else about that? Yeah, I mean, that that is the number one thing that we look for from any type of staff or librarian is that feedback because it's so crucial to make the software better. You know, we, most of us in the support world, at least at Biowater Solutions, we're a librarian prior to coming to Biowater Solutions. So about 85% of us have our MLIS or have worked in a library prior to coming to Biowater. So, you know, we remember working in a system, some of us on Koha, some of us on proprietary, and what makes it so crucial for us to help the community is getting that feedback from you. So you tell us, you know, what needs to be better. We want to know if it takes three clicks to complete something and you think it should only take one click, that's what we want to know. If you are, you know, processing a stack of records into the system and you think that it should be able to save those system preferences before you hit stage that file, we want to know that which PS it's coming in the next release. But those are things that we hear from people to make it better in the system. And so I think that's one of the greatest advantages of open source is working so closely with the community. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna suggest that at least 95 of the front facing developments that have happened within Koha, if not 100% of them are all library and driven. Um, there's some back-end security stuff that happens that's not librarian-driven, but from the front-end facing, there's not a development that comes down the pike that was not developed because a librarian in some Koha library decided they needed that tool. And then it went through the process, the community accepted that, lots of conversation about it, and we'll talk about that process here in a minute. But then you use that. Um, there was a presentation earlier today about um, housebound. There's a module in Koha talking about housebound. That's because a library saw a need and got that into Koha. That wasn't a company, a vendor saying, you know, here is a solution to a problem. It's the librarians saying, here are our problems. Let's come up with a solution. All right. Jesse, you want to start this one? Or? Yeah. So volunteers, you know, I, I, Cecilia mentioned this morning in her presentation, you know, about volunteering as open source is free or Koha is a free 
um, system that you can use. It relies on volunteers all over the world to be part of that process to keep it moving from release to release. You know, there's so many different roles that individuals can take part in as part of that community. As we just mentioned, you know, telling us what could be better in the system by providing that little piece of feedback, um, even sharing a little screenshot of how something works at your library. You know, whether you're checking something in and you're using the claims return feature, you take a screenshot of that. You know, we could take it a step further and put it in the manual. That way it helps three or four more people when they come and, you know, try and figure out how to use that claims returns module. So even if it's just, you know, a basic step-by-step -step instruction on how to use something, or it's a piece of code. I know Ed can share an awesome story. One time he was training out at um, the College of California Arts. Ed, and didn't they make a little change while you were sitting right there in training to uh, submit it back to the community? Yes, okay, it was. I had forgotten about this story, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> there was a, I, I did a lot of training. <laughs> um, one of the uh, individuals that was in the training was a, uh, their systems librarian was involved in coding and he submitted a patch to Koha and got the message as it was, it was going, submitting a patch is a, is a lengthy process. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but he submitted the patch and it had gotten through QA and he got the email that it was going to be in the next release um, that afternoon while we were in the middle of training and he got all excited. He was like, I'm already contributing to the community and he wasn't even been, he had not even completed the training yet. And he was already <laughs> contributing back to the community. Now, not all of us can do that. That takes somebody who ha really has some coding skills to jump in there and do that. Um, I'll tell another story on somebody who's not here, but it's being recorded and he knows this. Tell a story on Spencer, our library director. Um, when we were preparing to go to um, Koha Khan in Portland, that's the, the international convention, um, I told him we needed to go and he needed to come along and he needed to attend the last two days of the, of the program, which is all about, they called it a hack fest at that point. And, and his view was, I'm not a coder, I can't fix any of these problems. Why am I going to this? Why do you want me to go to this? Trust me, you'll get something out of it. What he got out of it was he became a great resource to the coders in the room. Everybody kept saying, well, what was that idea you talked about? Well, let's do this. Let's talk about this. Oh, well, that doesn't work. You know, and he became engaged with them. Didn't have to write the code, but was engaged in conversing and saying, no, that doesn't look right. What if you do it this way? Having all of those conversations. And then the realization hit him that, yes, this really is a community. And yes, you need to be there, whether you can write code or not. Okay. Anything else on the passion? All right, community, the whole thing is about community. I'm gonna jump forward through that. Um, ideas, it's what we're all talking about here. Everybody here is using Koha. You've got ideas, you've got different things. You need to express those. There's nothing worse than having a problem in the system that doesn't work for you and you just come up with a workaround and never tell anybody and it just goes on in frustration. And then something happens, you train, you have a new employee comes in and goes, that's not the best way to do something. <laughs> but that's the workaround. So then you've got to talk to the community. You've got to come, come up with these ideas for developments. Jesse? Yeah, and I think the next big piece to talk about is the idea of one person becomes the reality of everybody in the community. So, you know, that idea becomes a patch written by somebody, becomes a sign off by a librarian at a library somewhere in the world, um, is signed off by the release manager, and then is pushed out to every single person that is using Koha in the community. Because when you download that next release, that one idea now becomes the idea that is released to everybody in the community. And if that doesn't give you chills, then I don't know what will. Um, for those, has anybody, does anybody work with a proprietary vendor on anything? Yeah. 
there tends to be this 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 challenge and and it's not me versus them or us versus them or them versus but there is a they hold the keys to everything and you've got to try to get information out of them <laughs> Um, the uh, open source is so different that way. Um, you're, you're really dealing with the community. There are many people that are very willing to talk about any of this. Some, a whole lot more than others. And especially if adult beverages get involved, then it can get really lengthy. <laughs> um, but there is a, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a wonderful community. Jesse, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think a lot of the things, my background with proprietary bef before I, I came over to the vendor side of things was with Follett and Voyager. So at the time I was still a newbie librarian and I didn't really know where to hunt and peck for things. And I remember we had a, a big binder sitting on one of our shelves that was our manual. And, you know, it became very outdated quickly and I could not always find what I was looking for. And I feel like you have this challenge with the proprietary vendor where you sometimes get halted, where you don't get an answer, it takes a long time, and then you get stuck, you don't know what to do. And you know, with the open source community, you try once, you can't find it. If you try again, you may discover a different outlet, whether it was on an email listserv. You know, if you're watching the YouTube chat right now, there are people chatting back and forth about where they have found things or where they're sharing answers with. Fred already said, you know, he's giving a shout out back as he sees we're talking about him tomorrow. You know, people are out there and willing to respond. We're gonna talk about IRC here in a little bit, which is, you know, how Koha has their general meetings. and you can figure out a way with the community, you know, bouncing ideas around. It's the best way to, to move forward. Um, I, I spent a number of years as a systems admin for a Cersei Donix library. And to get information, you had to be on the list. And then you had to be on, that was to get the basic information. But then if you had a complex question, you had to have the secret keys to the secret password for the API particular piece of secrets. And there were all these barriers to getting information. And it's because they have a proprietary piece of information that they don't want to share with anybody. And that is diametrically opposite of the Koha community. I Google it and you can find all sorts of answers. Not all of them are, are, are the best answer. <laughs> Uh, as with anything like that. All right, shared responsibility. Jesse, I'll let you talk quickly about the, the development process here because that's yeah. what this is. So when you think about the development process for Koha, there are several steps that take place. So how many in the audience or on YouTube have at least gone to Bugzilla before and checked out some of the um, steps that have taken place, see what people have done, or even have a Bugzilla account. You know, that's kind of your, your running, your starting place where you can see suggestions that people have made, deep conversations where people are going back and forth about a suggestion that was made. And this is where we're going to track enhancements and any type of bug fixes in the Koha community. So there's various roles for each of the you know, releases that come through, two major releases with Koha. So for each release, you have a release manager um, who is going to maintain that release, make sure that the release moves forward and then launches it by the release date. You have members of the quality assurance team. Those are the members who are checking each one of those enhancements or bugs that are being fixed, making sure that they're working processly, they don't break anything else. You know, not every bug or enhancement that gets suggested gets passed right away. A lot of times you'll see a failed QA, meaning it may have broke something else. And that's the beauty of quality assurance. Um, you have release maintainers. So, you know, there are libraries who are self-supported or supported by a vendor who may be on a previous release. So when the new release comes out, the release maintainers will make sure that those older releases are also getting any type of updates as they go through. And then of course we have documentation. 
again, one of the strengths of open source is having documentation online that you can find at any given time. So making sure we have an up-to-date release manual. So all of those pieces are so important, um, you know, as you're working with that shared responsibility. So giving that feedback and sharing that information. And then of course, working with a support vendor. So if you are working with a support vendor um, for your for your open source product, you wanna make sure that you communicate with them regularly. That is the most important piece of it. Make sure that you're giving them feedback, asking questions, share your workflows. You know, that's one of the little pieces of the puzzle that you can give back. You know, if, if you're noticing that something's not working properly or, you know, you've cataloged something and, and something just doesn't seem right, one of the values are, are broken, you know, giving those examples back is what helps make the product stronger. You know, I, I always tell people share, share real life examples, you know, because we want to see that, you know, screenshots or step-by-steps on how you got to that. And then if, if you don't listen to anything else, I say communicate, and that's the most important piece of it. Um, I want to step back real quickly and talk about the roles again. All of those are not mysterious roles. Anybody can take those roles. You just have to get active in the community. Um, it, it, it simply means setting up a Bugzilla account, being active in the IRC, attending the meetings, and you can help the community. Um, they are always looking for people for documentation. The community is always trying to, trying to drum up assistance in the documentation side of things. Um, it takes a little bit of, it takes a good bit of, of know-how to do, be a release manager. Um, the QA is very important. I tell people, whether you know anything or not about the coding, get on Bugzilla and find the test, the bugs that need testing and run them through a, 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 a sandbox. Um, Bywater provides some really nice sandboxes to test bugs in. You can go in there and do that. If it doesn't work for you, fail it. Don't hesitate to fail it and say what it didn't do that you expected it to do. Um, that's another thing that, that I think in that communication tool um, and when testing some bugs, you have an idea of what you expect it to do. What did it do? And what is the difference in what it did and what you expected? it? Because there can be a problem in any of those three stages. Your expectation could be wrong, it could be wrong, or, you know, there, there are a lot of differences there. All right. Ways to get plugged into the community. Um, IRC and Slack. If I presume this is almost universally true, most city and school IT departments block IRC. I hate it, but that's the fact. I've never worked in an institution that will let me have IRC access. So I either have to use their public Wi-Fi to connect to IRC or my own device. Um, the uh, Bywater uh, vendors provided a Slack access. So that's a way to talk to them. Um, that's not the community at large, that's only Bywater. Um, and then there's email. Um, there are monthly meetings for both the Koha community at large, Koha US, and um, there are special interest groups within the um, Koha US community. I will go ahead and give a quick plug here. We've got a, we started a North Texas Koha group, and then this little problem hit called COVID and everything kind of fell apart. This is pretty much a North Texas in-person group. Thanks to all the wonderful people worldwide that are watching. Most of the people here are from and around this area. So this can give us a head start on getting that going once again. Um, there are also special interest groups for, what is their cataloging? Um, is there, there's, help, help me out with it. <laughs> Acquisitions. Is the, the, the web design and then there's also a, is there still a sysadmin or is that one kind of, okay. Consortium. Yeah. So wh whatever kind of library you're in, there's, an, there's a lot active community out there. Uh, 
There are also just a lot of great resources through the community's website as well as the Koha US website. All right, Bugzilla. I presume by now everybody's heard of Bugzilla since we've already talked about it. Um, one misconception that I discovered a lot when I was doing training is because the name of it's Bugzilla, they think everything in here is a bug, a, a problem, and that is not the case. This is how all the developments are tracked. The, the software is called Bugzilla. <laughs> so everything gets a bug number. <laughs> And it allows us to, it allows the entire community to track everything. Um, Jesse, what do you want to say about it? I just want to say, even if you just want to lurk and see what's going on and see what people are talking about, it's a good place to get your foot in the door. You know, you can create a free account. All you need is an email. And this allows you to go in and you can search for bugs by a certain topic. So if you wish that the holds process was a little bit easier or faster, you know, those are things that you can come in here and look for in the system. Um, there's multiple um, webinars that you can watch, you know, basic how to set up a Bugzilla account, how to search, how to file a bug. Um, if you're, you know, wanting to go through and look for easy sign-offs, you can even do an advanced search and just look for bugs that may need some basics by, again, using the sandboxes that Ed mentioned earlier. You can go in, load it up. You don't have to know any code on the back end. It will whip up that um, sandbox instance of Koha for you, and you can go through and do some basic testing. So if you're looking for a, a real easy way to go in and, and start seeing what other people are talking about, this is a, a great way to do it. Resources. We've talked about all these, but here they are. Um, the, the community website, kohacommunity.org. That is a worldwide community. There is, there, there's, the website and then there's the wiki and they kind of get intermingled. <laughs> you can jump from the website to the wiki and back to the website without even really knowing it. Um, but they're both out there. Koha US is doing a great job developing training tools, things like that. They've recently posted, we've put together some um, one page, uh, you know, like you had in college where you had the one laminated page that had all the algebra or all the physics or all the English. <laughs> Um, they've created a number of those for different circulation, different, different get start, you know, basically get started quick cheat sheets for Koha. They're very well done. Um, as with anything, we've got to keep them maintained or they're going to become stale. That's another way to become active in this community. Um, the project yeah, sure. dashboard. Yeah, I'll let you talk about that one. Yeah, this is a good place too to go. If you want to see what's coming in the next release, you can see like recently signed off bugs, um, bugs that need sign off. This is just a great, another great place to go and lurk. You know, you can kind of see what's coming down the pipeline. Um, when the international conference happens and they do their bug fest or their bug bug squash, you know, hack fest or when they're bug bug squashing, I can't ever say that, uh, bug squashing events, the dashboard tends to track all of that too. And it's fun to see who's submitting, a, you know, the um, patches and everything. Barbara, who was um, sitting in here earlier today, she's from Bedford. Um, not too long ago, she was in the top three or four, you know, um, patch uh, submitters or, or past QA, you know, had done a lot. So there are a lot of people very involved in this and local people. All right, any questions for us? Jason, any questions online? I don't, I don't see any questions. You're getting a lot of good feedback. Um, Chris Cormack's here, he's giving you props. So. All right, hi Chris. Good. Hi Chris. <laughs> And yes. Heather shared her favorite um, bug in Bugzilla. I recommend everyone click that. So. All right, I've got a question here. Um, and I probably need to see a couple of the libraries that are different schools online. I, my library is still on a couple of prices, and I can see, identify some of the big cultural distinctions between the two. I was very curious about 
your experience getting set the change, you know, because it teaches you those habits, like you want to capture the city and just like this is how it's very hard what you're doing, and you don't have this culture of we are a part of the process of the business. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what do you do if you're with the rest of your team and you are right you're doing this to get them to develop that attitude? All right. The question is about um, uh, from an individual here who's not on COHA, still in, a, in the proprietary world, how to make that transition with the staff once you've already made the leap to the open source software. It's hard. Um, and I, I will say this. There are a couple of people here that I trained when I was with Bywater years ago, and I'm still we're still working on it. It, it, it. It's 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 hard. It is a hard transition. It, it's intellectually easy, but you've been trained so long to to behave in a particular way that it's 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 hard. Um, do I have any magic bullets? Absolutely not. We've just got to talk about it. The, mm -hmm. I think the best way to do it is to find a few key people to get them involved in the community. Once they get involved in the community, and, and when I say key people, people that are also actively involved in the community and culture of your institution, then they can spread that. Otherwise, it's hard. <laughs> yes, I got another question. Change over 2019, and I will say, and then for me, I'm not going to hold it out for the other people. You know, we don't have a sexual situation, but well, now it is difficult. But anyway, um, part of I think the challenge is that we run into is that we've gotten, we have gotten so used to being involved, um, sorry, we do that. Uh, can we do this? Well, we got to either come up with a budget or we got to figure out a way to work around it, or we need to be patient and let it happen. Let it get out of the do that. Also, it's been in our staff mentality that we are all jacks of all trades in the library, and it's becoming very apparent, I think, even to our director, that somebody has got to spend time not at the circulation desk, but back in a little cubicle somewhere, doing some of this stuff, getting into the community and learning and presenting issues and getting feedback that that's part of the, the process as opposed to maybe picking a phone call or calling the guy at Bibliotics and saying, we can, can we do this? No? Okay, thanks, bye, and be done. So it takes, it, it, it's a very different mindset. Then you buy a car and say, I want to have air conditioning, and this brand doesn't offer that. So you go to the next table. You know yeah. um, I'm going to try to repeat some of that for the people that are online that couldn't hear it. Then we'll get to get to your question next. Um, Wally was just talking about they've recently migrated pre-COVID and throughout all of this um, time. And, and basically they've learned that they do need to identify different staff members to spend time taking the time off desk, in the back, becoming part of the community. Is that good? <laughs> Okay, yes, you had a question over here. Okay, I'm going to have a little bit of a question here. You're saying to me that open source works with Koha. Koha is an open source ILS. Okay, okay. So anything that, because we, we have problems with um, Koha, uh, the system itself, sometimes. Um, and it's so you're saying if we... Um, become a part of the community and then open source, we can get a lot of those questions answered that we don't know. Yes. Okay. So is, is there a, a, a price tag? Well, 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 let's step back. Are you, are you, have you, you, are you using Koha independently or are you using a support vendor to help manage it? No. Okay, so you're doing it independently. Okay, um, yes, there's a great community. There's no money involved in that. 
Um, there is a great community out there. Uh, some of these resources we went to, um, there are th these addresses, there are emails. Um, I talked to Fred earlier. Fred is going to do a presentation and he is in that boat. He has created all, he's done it all himself. So there's a, and he relies on the community greatly. He would be a great resource for you to help you find answers. Um, there's another gentleman here, um, John, who's the treasurer of Koha US, who, was, who also spent a long time self-supported in, in the Koha world. There are lots of, there's a community that can help you. That's what this is all about, all right? There's also vendors that you can pay to help you with that, but you know, and they come with a price tag. <laughs> I presume they're still coming with a price tag because you all would like to eat, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes. But then those people empower other people. It's all about showing people that they can do it. So if you have some people that are really willing to dive in and play around and learn it, then they can help other people out. Like, Look at the cool stuff you can actually do that we can change that kind of to go, you know, to the library director who's going to talk to this person and do it. And then you start realizing, I can catch these mistakes and bring it to someone's attention. And a lot of times, like, they can be fixed instantly or something that, yeah, that'd be a cool development. So it's never just a no. So just start empowering those people because that'll make a huge difference. So I think you know, I who are these people? Are they library aides? Are they <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, people that kind of jump in, like they're really willing to work and they'll go, yeah, like let me play with this. Let me try to break this or let me dig in. Let me try to break this. <laughs> but I mean, really like, I'm like, <laughs> the breaker. But like, I love to learn about stuff. So like, you find those people in your organization and it can just be like a part time assistant. Or it could be a director, like it can be anyone. And I think that's what's so great is that like, everyone has a voice. So it's not just, no, we're not listening to you because you're just this like frontline worker. It's like, well, no, they're using this system. Yeah. So start listening to them and you empower them to make things. Okay, I can't repeat everything that's just been said here. There's too much of it, but it's all about. <laughs> no kidding. It, 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 it's, it's all about the, the, you know, finding the right people to plug into the, into the community that, that they have. They're the people that are going to invigorate the rest of your staff. If you can get those in, involved, that's it. Jay-Z, do you have anything else? Yeah, that, that's a hundred percent. Like think about, I'm sure you've all seen this um, little video clip where there's like one person that's dancing like at a festival and that one person goes out and starts dancing and you, you need that one person because then everybody else, it was a Ted talk. And then everybody else starts and goes out and gets dancing because he made the first move. So find that person who is your open source believer. And once you find that person, then everybody else will just come and, and keep following that person. All right. Any other questions? All right. Anything else in parting, Jesse? If anyone ever has questions about the open source community or you don't know where to get started or you just need someone to talk to, know Ed and I are always here. We, we love helping people get involved in the community. I learned everything from Ed. Um, Ed was my mentor when I first started. So I am always happy to share that same passion that he shared with me almost six or seven years ago. All right. Thank you all.